There we go. All right. So hello, everybody, and welcome to Hashtag Open Ed. It is our fourth week in this now um, weekly series that we plan on keeping going for as long as we can. So thank you to everybody who's been joining us. Um, we're hoping more people will get going with us tonight. Um, I'm going to start by telling you guys a little bit about Hashtag Open, and then I'm really excited for Sarah to introduce Jacqueline, our guest tonight. So if you haven't heard about Hashtag Open, we are an inclusive dating app that offers a range of different ways to identify your orientation and your relationship status so that you can really put who you are out there in the dating world. Um, we also offer options to date solo or partnered. So you can choose your experience. You can um, have both profiles or one or the other um, so that you can date with a partner if that's something you're looking for. We have partner chats so that you guys can both um, view the chats there. Um, and that helps with some of the catfishing that we know happens with partner dating. Um, and then we use hashtags to communicate preferences, interests, and boundaries so that you can find people who are looking for the same things as you are. So it's a great place to find people, especially during isolation, finding people to connect with. We know that, you know, while we can't connect in real life, there's plenty of ways to connect online. So finding friends who are looking for those connections right now is a great way to um, kind of stave off the isolation blues. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Sarah and she's going to tell you more about what we're diving into tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Miley. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so for those of you who I have not met yet, my name is Sarah Sloan, and I'm uh, the communications and education consultant for Hashtag Open. And I am super, super, super excited for our uh, conversation tonight. Um, something that is really, uh, I think, at the core of everything that we talk about uh, when we're talking about sex and relationship um, education is consent. And it's how we navigate um, consent both both in our interpersonal in our intimate relationships, but also in the in the greater spectrum. And um, we've been really fortunate with the hashtag open to work with Jacqueline Friedman for uh, the past year or so. Uh, Jacqueline is actually somebody who was um, at the absolute core of helping develop the policies that we use to create a safe space on the app. So um, I, I will introduce or do her formal introduction in just a moment. But um, when we were talking about uh, what topics were coming up for people um, and Jacqueline, you know, said like, hey, I think I think there's conversations that need to happen, like all of our ears perked up because this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's easy to, to think about consent as this very binary yes or no thing, but there's so many nuanced layers to it. And the stress that we're all under right now, whether it's um, because we're solo isolating, whether we're isolating with partners or we're isolating with family, um, we're, we're, we're really put in a place where these issues are coming to the surface much more quickly. Um, so I'm really glad to have Jacqueline here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Jacqueline. Uh, first of all, you can visit uh, Jacqueline's website. It's www.jacquelinefriedman.com. It's on the graphic that we have on the screen right now. Um, Jacqueline has an amazing body of work, and I would definitely encourage you to go visit Jacqueline's website. So um, Jacqueline is a leading feminist writer, educator, and activist whose four books include Yes Means Yes, Visions of Female Sexual Power and a World Without Rape, which was one of Publishers Weekly's top 100 books of 2009, and the, four, and the actual new book, Believe Me, How Trusting Women Can Change the World. Um, her podcast, Unscrewed, yay! <laughs> Um, her podcast, Unscrewed, which uh, was named one of the best sex podcasts by both Marie Claire and Esquire. Uh, Jacqueline's work has been pop has popularized the yes means yes standard of sexual consent that has been made into law in several U.S. states and has been codified on countless campuses around the country and around the world. Um, her commentary has appeared in out outlets like the New York Times, Vox, Time, Washington Post, Glamour, and The Guardian. Um, Jacqueline is a founder and the former executive director of Women Action in the Media, where she led the successful FB rape campaign to apply Facebook's hate speech ban to content that promotes gender-based violence. Um, so so Jacqueline has been a thought leader on consent for uh, a really long time and has just paved the way for so much groundbreaking work, both her own and other folks. So we're really excited to have 
Jacqueline here today. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Jacqueline. Um, I'd love for you to tell people a little bit about why this, why, why having this conversation now feels so important. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot because it's coming up in so many ways that are outside of our sexual and intimate relationships and also deeply in our sexual and intimate relationships. So I think that I, I told you, Sarah, when, when we were coming up with the idea for this conversation that I had just been to the post office and people were not wearing masks and they were standing closer than I was comfortable with. And I found it really difficult to speak up and say something, right? To say like, hey, I would feel better if you would take a step back, which is really basic boundary setting, consent practices. And yet, um, because the stakes feel so high, because we're all super stressed out, um, it's straining even my ability to do these, these kinds of basic negotiations. And when we're not able to say that to a stranger in the post office, it also is it can be a sign that we're having a hard time in our personal lives, setting those boundaries and maintaining our consent as well. Um, and also, you know, this kind of stress can affect us all in really different ways. So if you are isolating with a partner uh, and this kind of stress is making you feel really horny, like you feel like afraid and one of the ways that you want to comfort yourself is with sex, right? That's really okay and natural. But maybe your partner is feeling truly the opposite way and like couldn't possibly imagine having sex right now because they're too stressed out. And those negotiations can be hard on a good day, but when we're all depleted and 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 afraid um, and sometimes not physically not feeling well, um, that really puts a strain on our ability to maintain a healthy affirmative consent practice to speak up for our own boundaries and our own desires. And so it just seemed like a really good time to have a check in to say, like, how's everybody doing? Where are the stress points happening in your life? Yeah. Um, they might also be happening, you know, because you don't have any privacy and feeling like you don't have any option, but being around people all the time can, in fact, make you not want to touch or be near anybody whatsoever, right? Um, or it could be that you're in a coercive situation that's been made worse by this crisis, right? So we know that rates of abuse in inside homes are going through the roof right now um, because dynamics that were already semi-present, maybe boil, you know, simmering on the back burner are now flaring up. Um, and we want to help you too if you're in one of those situations. So this is showing up in our lives all kinds of ways. We also know that folks who are engaged in sex work of various kinds are having their lives turned upside down. And so this is showing up in that way also. So um, because a lot of folks who were doing in-person sex sexual work are now moving into the cam video space. Um, the I, I've heard, you know, and, and all, all this is anecdotal because it's all happening right now and, and not enough attention is being paid to sex workers that um, it's driving prices down, um, that there's more competition. And so that kind of financial pressure can also put pressure on your ability to say yes or no or maintain boundaries. And also there are going to be new customers who are maybe having their sexual needs met some other how before the crisis, but now are turning to cam work or phone, you know, that, that sort of online sex work, um, but don't know how to fucking behave. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so there's just a lot of stress coming from a lot of directions. And, and I thought, you know, this would be a great time to just hear how it's playing out in, in everybody's lives who's on this call and to talk about what's coming up for folks and how we can, how we can help each other. Yeah, I've noticed that, um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who generally feels like I handle consent conversations pretty well. You know, it's like, it's kind of part of what I do. But I, I've, yeah. I've even noticed that, you know, like, oh, it's been really hard for me to to have those conversations that three months, six months ago, I think would have been easier. Um, so it, it's not even, you know, I think it's also, even if this is something that you generally do pretty well, it's putting us all in a position of having to kind of take a new look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for my partner and I, it's even just down to the like level of like, do we feel snuggly right now, right? Yeah. It's because there's a lot of desire to be physical and close and, and kind of comfort each other. And then like for me, 
very quickly it will come over me like actually I don't want to be touched at all right you know like and it's I'm so all over the place that it's it can make I'm not the same as you like I my I think a lot about consent all day long. I like to think I have a really strong consent practice, but this is testing mine. So I can only imagine it's testing everybody else's. Yeah. yeah. And I know that we had a couple of questions that came in that we can yeah. kind of get started off with. Miley. Uh, there. Yeah. Let me jump in with the first one that we got through Instagram. Um, this user said, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I need and how do I communicate that in general? Do you have any tips? Yeah. And I, I would say to this user, like, asking that question is actually a plus right so figuring out what you need is the first step to a great consent practice and so the fact that you're asking that question and flagging that as the place where the trouble is laying for you i just want to give you like a gold star for that insight um yeah you may need extra time alone and that may be way harder to come by if you have kids if you have other people in the house um, you may need to communicate your uncertainty. Um, so you may need to say to your partner or, or whoever you might need or not need things from, I don't, I'm having a hard time. Like literally what you just said to me, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I need. And so maybe I don't want to do this for, with you right now, or maybe could, is it possible to arrange for a half an hour every day where I'm truly alone in some room um, <laughs> or whatever your setup is, you know, whether maybe it's the bathroom. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that each of us having time to some way tune into our own frequency is more important than ever right now. So, um, maybe that's a journaling practice. Also, if you can't be truly physically alone, maybe you can be alone with your thoughts by just writing, free writing. Like, don't worry about what you're saying or whether it's coherent or whether your handwriting's any good. Just set 10 minutes on a timer and just write. And it, it's just a practice of teaching yourself to listen to yourself and to tune into your own frequency and to pay attention to non-sexual things that feel good or don't feel good in your body like literally just tune into like does this type of movement feel good right like does this taste good this thing I, that i'm eating like do i like having bare feet or do i like having them in socks right the more you can tune in to the very small elemental moments of what's happening inside yourself and your body the, the more you're going to get closer to knowing what you want I will take this moment to say I have a book that will help you with that. It's called What You Really, Really Want. And it's literally for helping to figure out what you want from a sexual life. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of things you can do without buying the book. And I'm not I'm not here to give you a hard sell. But <laughs> if that book is useful to you, take a look at that as well. Awesome. I think that's a really interesting point, too, just with going back to, um, you know, setting those boundaries, I find, and taking the time to really, like, you know, appreciate the little things. Right now, with working from home, I feel like we're just on screens constantly, and finding the time, it's like, even when I do have alone time, like, I feel I'm still on my phone scrolling, and, like, I just, when I actually take the time to turn everything off and do something for myself that's actually self-care and relaxing and, you know, get away from the screens for a while, um, setting those boundaries for myself has been really helpful. The screen stuff is so hard right now because a lot of, that's a lot of where this sort of comfort food and distraction is coming from. And, but it does, mm -hmm. it does zone you out in a way that also distracts you from hearing yourself, I think. So I think there's a balance, right? Like the, we're, right. I don't know that anyone here is saying like, don't use screens, don't watch TV, whatever, don't play phone games. But but I do think, I agree, like when I've managed to put my phone down and like read for an hour instead, right. it feels yeah. very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, just a reminder for folks who are in chat, um, if you have questions, feel free to uh, post them over there and we will make sure that uh, Jacqueline can yeah. hear them. Um, so uh, let's move on to our next question, Miley. Yeah, we had um, a question that came through email that um, I think this one's a great one for Jacqueline to really dive into. Um, this user says um, that th I'm a sexual assault survivor and I'm feeling triggered a lot right now in this confine confinement. Like many others, my partner was, was laid off and is watching a lot of porn while I work from home. To me, it feels like a lot of the stuff that he's looking at is not really consensual. Think misogynist subreddits, um, upskirt celebrity photos, etc. 
we started some remote couple, couples counseling and the counselors framed this in terms of an addiction. I would like to trust this, but I feel worried that my feelings are coming from trauma and that I'm inadvertently sex shaming my partner. I feel like I'm going crazy and that I can't trust anyone or anything, including my own feelings of panic around what I see as this problematic porn. What is the right feminist and sex positive thing to do? Woo. Okay. Yeah. There's so many things to unpack in this question. And the first thing I want to say is, listener, I'm so sorry you're going through this. It sounds incredibly upsetting and stressful. And I'm not surprised you feel all those things that you described. Um, I want to... I want to pick apart the layers of this question and just identify what they are. Um, so there is a question in here about, I think about a partner who's watching porn while the other partner is trying to work. And it sounds to me, it's not quite explicit, but it sounds to me like they're in literally the same space. So you could at least hear the porn while you're trying to work. Right. Um, that's what I get from that. Um, there's a question about non-consensual porn, meaning not porn that fetishizes non-consent, which may be fantasy or, you know, like that you could play out a scene and it's clear that all the players are consenting to enact it, but they're playing out a scene about non-consent. But in this case, the issue is that the women, it sounds like, are have not consented to being featured in this porn, um, which is a real issue. Um, and then the third issue is I think that you are being made to feel like your feelings are not valid. Um, that sort of question of addiction and whether you have a right to ask your partner to behave differently. Um, so I'm gonna order them, answer them I think in that order. Does that make sense to you too? Yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. Okay. So. I think that you have an absolute right for your partner to watch, not watch porn in the same physical space that you're in while you're working. That doesn't feel complicated to me at all. Like you're, you're trying to do your job. It's not, it's hard enough that we're all working from home now. Right. And, and which is unusual, but you're trying to run your professional life and make money and keep yourselves fed and housed. Um, and if you want to not hear, about porn or see that they're on porn, they're looking at porn while you're on in your work day, like have be confronted with that porn during your work day. I think that is an immensely reasonable boundary, um, immensely reasonable. I don't know if the two of you have further thoughts about that, but it, that just seems very cut and dry to me. I think there's also an issue sometimes of like, we have to, to freedom from being around sexual material yeah. then you know it's like i i don't necessarily feel like if you're up you know if you're if you're not into the same kind of porn or the same kind of sex that your partner wants to check out like you don't have to be in that room while that's happening um, yeah and and so and i and as somebody who's a survivor of sexual abuse um, one of the things that is most diff was most difficult for me for the first few years that I was working with it was realizing that I had the right to say, I don't want this to be around me right now. Even, yeah. even if that's something that you like, we need to negotiate where that, like, how are you going to get that desire met and also respect my boundaries? Um, so, so yeah, I think absolutely. Like if you, if you have, if you are exposed to any kind of sexuality, um, any kind of porn that makes you feel uncomfortable, like that's a, that's a really clear, like you have a right to have that space without that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, can your partner go watch it or read it, it in the bathroom? Um, if there's no bedroom door to close, like your partner can go somewhere else and make sure if there's noise, can your partner wear headphones and make sure the screen is not anywhere near you. Yeah. You were trying to work. Um, even if there were nothing ethically concerning about this particular porn, if you don't want to be exposed to it, you you absolutely have the right to not be exposed to it. Yeah. Um, and your partner can take some very basic steps to respect that without curtailing their porn habit in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not sex shaming, right? Like that's no. none of that is sex shaming. So the the next question is about non-consensual porn. And again, I want to be really clear that here we are talking about porn 
pornographic materials that have been produced without the consent of the people who are featured in them, not porn that promotes or presents fantasies about non-consent, which is a much different conversation. Um, this also seems very crisply immoral to me. Um, you know, you can call it not feminist. I think that it is really baseline, like dehumanizing and violating and immoral. I think it's actually a kind of sexual violence. I think upskirting is absolutely a kind of sexual violence. Um, and, and that's really hard because you're living in a house with this person who I assume it sounds like you're already talking about this. You've expressed your concerns to them and they are not concerned. They don't share your, your morals about this. Um, and that's, that's going to be an issue for your relationship. Um, and that's a hard thing to navigate right now when you leave, right? Like, and, um, it, it's a, it's a hard time to sort of think about like, is this the relationship that I want to be in? But, I would, if I myself discovered that my partner felt no compunction about consuming non-consensual porn, um, I would think twice about that relationship, honestly, because that's somebody who doesn't respect other people's boundaries and other people's sovereignty as humans. Um, that may not be something you can act on right now. Uh, and you you might want to think about getting some teletherapy of your own, especially if you can have some privacy in the house. Again, go take a, a few pillows and put them in the bathtub and like hang out in the bathroom for an hour. Like um, if you can get some privacy, uh, it'd be really useful to get a teletherapist if you can't afford that. Um, rape crisis hotlines, I'm sure would be very happy to talk to you about this, even though it's not an immediate crisis. I think this is absolutely something that they'd be happy to support you around. Um, calling a helpline, talking to friends. Um, you may not be able to act on this right now if your partner, if you genuinely have sat down with your partner and said, here is why this troubles me and really spelled it out. And they have blown you off about that. You, you may need just some short-term support about living in that relationship before you have the freedom to think about whether you want to stay. Um, and I just want to honor that that's really so hard right now. Yeah. Um, as an FYI to anybody who's listening, if you are in a position where you need to reach out or you want to reach out to somebody and you're not sure where to reach out, um, you can um, message any of us directly on social media um, or you can, you can go into the hashtag open app and hit the support. Um, but we, and we will be happy to connect you. Um, most states are very aware that, that folks are in really uncomfortable situations right now. And so a lot of, uh, hotlines that are generally what we would think of as kind of like domestic violence hotlines are actually really able to help connect you to folks that you can talk to that can help you just feel safe in your own home and feel safe in terms of what, what you can do to take care of yourself during this time. Um, so please, if you're in that position, please reach out and, and we, we are 100% down for helping connect you to resources. That's wonderful. Yeah. And pretty unusual for a dating app, I have to say. <laughs> um, it's one of the things I really love about hashtag open. Like they're, there are real people behind all of those accounts who really want to support you. Um, and now the third piece we come to, which is this question of addiction um, and the way the narrative is getting framed. I have to tell you that there is no reliable science that, ver that validates the idea that somebody can have a sex addiction or a porn addiction. It just does not function biologically the same way that drugs and alcohol do. Uh, it's not a thing. It's a very popular misconception. Um, but I have questions about, I would ask your therapist where they're getting that information from, if they can provide science to back that idea up. Um, if you have an option to try a different therapist who has an actual background in sexual issues, um, 
maybe one that has been certified by ASECT, um, which is the, oh gosh, what is the acronym ASECT? Uh, American oh, Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Yeah, so an ASECT th certified therapist probably would have a much better perspective on this behavior. Now, it may be a compulsion. There may be something psychological going on here. It may be a coping mechanism. There are a lot of things we can call it, but the language of addiction does not apply here. Um, but even so, it sounds to me like you're being asked to make room for your partner's addiction, right? Your partner's issue without anyone making room for what you need, right? Either the therapist or your partner. And that's what really troubles me in this dynamic. Like we can get into that addiction compulsion, that whole conversation. But the thing that troubles me even more than that is like that you're being asked just to develop better empathy for the, your partner and nobody seems to be developing empathy or space for you and what you need and your needs are just as important um, and you, you have just as much of a right to them uh, and you need to not be exposed to this and that's valid. There's, none of this is sex shaming. Absolutely none of this is sex shaming. And if somebody has suggested that to you, they're fucking with your head. Um, so, whew, I mean, I hope this helps. I know none of this is like gonna magically make your world better right now, but I just wanna validate that like you are being, you sound very reasonable to me, <laughs> like incredibly reasonable. And you're being put in a really hard spot by somebody who's treating you and other people quite, quite badly. Um, and so you're, you're not crazy and you're not sex shaming and you're not anti-feminist and whatever other head trip is getting put on you. Um, you absolutely have the right to go through your life without being exposed to this and also to object to the actual content as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jacqueline. Um, I know, you know, when, when there has been trauma and we are in a culture where right now we're all kind of living in a constant state of trauma, that figuring out what, what is true yeah, it can be really difficult. Um, it can be really difficult, especially when you're like only seeing this one person and they yeah. become your world kind of, right? And um, it sounds like not a space that has a lot of privacy. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just, I, I definitely want to reiterate that, you know, the definition of sex positive doesn't mean accepting of all sex and all kinds of sex in your space. You know, like to me, sex positivity is like, it's, it's, everybody has the right to the kinds of sex that, that feel good for them and feel good for their partners. Um, but that doesn't mean that you, you know, that, like, that doesn't mean that you have to do a thing or be present for a thing that doesn't feel right for you. Cause and, and also that head trip is age old, right? I, when I was writing Unscrewed, uh, I was doing some research on women's experiences during the 60s sexual revolution here in the US. And there were firsthand accounts of women who said like, that they were getting pressured into sex by guys who were like, oh, you're not adequately woke about sex if you don't want to fuck me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so that, yeah. <laughs> that, that line is, it's ancient. Yeah. And it was just as tired bullshit then as it is now. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, even the idea of her feeling like she's a bad feminist when it seems like everybody here is catering to the the, the male partner's mm -hmm. needs and nobody's thinking about her needs yeah. at all. And, you know, no, I think that you trying to set those bad boundaries as you, you know, trying to be, you know, that's, right. what, that's what feminists are. Yeah, and one really of your boundaries could be, I need a different couple yeah. therapist. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So, yeah, don't feel like a bad feminist. I hate that. I hate hearing women yeah. like being so hard on themselves on, on, on that yeah. front. So thank you, Jacqueline, for a deep dive. That was a great question. And so many components there and so many different aspects. That, um, yeah, so thank you, Jacqueline. That was great information. Um, another question we had was, if you have specific tips on how to schedule alone time, you talked a little bit about some of the, you know, actual um you know just taking time for uh digging into your senses and taking that time but do you have any other tips on how to actually make sure that you you dedicate that time for yourself yeah i mean it 
obviously there are a million different configurations and I can't speak to every single one, but I think that it'd be great if you sat down with the people in your household who ha are old enough to be decision makers and have opinions about these sorts of things, right? So not little, little kids, but, you know, medium little kids might have opinions about this and want to have buy-in. Like maybe you could agree as a household that everybody has the right to be alone a little bit right now, right? That this is hard and you're alone, you're together a lot more than you otherwise would be. And everybody gets the same right to be alone a little bit. Maybe the parents have more right than the kids. You get to make the rules. But, um, at, and then if you have no kids, then just your partner, or whoever you're living with, or um, to say like, I have this need. I can imagine you have this need too. And that can feel a little easier than just being like, I need an hour by myself, right? And then that person might be like, well, I fucking need that too. So um, if you start the conversation by saying, clearly we all need some alone time. Let's figure out how to structure that, right? Does everybody get X amount of time a day or does do I get a bigger chunk every other day and you get that big chunk that every other day? Or, you know, there are a million ways to actually work it out. But I think the most important thing is to make it explicit and to make it feel fair. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that, I also want to say that men don't get credit for babysitting their children. Mm -hmm. that's parenting yeah. uh <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> coming up a lot right now so like men don't get extra time off because they have to look after the kids while you're taking your time off because what are you doing in the time off you're looking after when you're not taking time off you're all you're parenting the children also like everybody's parenting and it can be hard if 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 the guy still has a job and you may and a woman maybe doesn't um, in a heterosexual partnership, it, a lot of gendered stuff is coming up right now. <laughs> um, but I just want to be super crystal clear that men don't get like yeah. extra gold stars for parenting their own children. And I think that the ways that um, men have been taught to communicate their needs, um, you know, like like they're as much a victim of of this bullshit system that we're in. Um, and I think that by by kind of bringing it out on the table and say like, hey, this is, you know, like I want us to all talk about what our needs are so that we can figure out like where where in the Venn diagram can we all get our needs met? How does that happen? Yeah. Um, you know, it, and, and I like I find it coming up a lot around folks who are poly right now or polyamorous. Um, you know, I've I've had people who have said that they got really upset because um, one partner has decided to do a more risky behavior in terms of going out to see another partner. Um, you know, like my, you know, my partner that I am seeing during, during this, who's not seeing anyone else, we've already started to kind of broach the conversation of like when it's time for us to expand, what's going to, and, and to actually see our other partners, what are the things that we're going to do? And so I think that, you know, in this case, being willing to have the conversation and and being willing to assume like the end goal is that we all want to make sure that our needs get met um can really prime us for having a really great consent conversation without it being as much of a shame or a guilt trigger or without it kind of creating that defensiveness that a lot of times we all feel when we're trying to figure out like how do how do we get our own needs met and I think those conversations that we're having, hopefully, with our pods, with the people that we're isolated with, if we're isolated with other people, about, like, you know, you know, my partner and I very early on in this said, we have to make decisions about risk together, because whatever risk you're exposed to, I'm exposed to, right? Because, um, and that's true when we're negotiating about safer sex practices yeah. all the time. And so I think this is actually a great moment to see those parallels, right? And, to, you know, like negotiating what risks you're comfortable with your partner taking in terms of exposure to COVID-19. Um, that The structure of that conversation is exactly the same yeah. as the way we negotiate what risks we want or willing to take and not willing to take when it comes to some of the risks that come along with uh, exposure to possible disease. Um, so, uh, 
if you when you see those in parallel, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, and absolutely. It's also interesting because I think kind of we, you know, like we started out um, our initial convers cultural conversations around consent were like no means no, right? They came from a very like like I can say no to things, which was a great place for us to start. Um, and you know, like we've we've moved now to yes means yes. Um, but I think what what sometimes I think folks don't necessarily register in this is that there are lots of ways that we are safe. Um, and we think about STIs, we think about physical safety, but there's also emotional safety and spiritual safety. Um, and so, you know, like these conversations are the same, you know, like they build our skills for having those bigger consent conversations. When we can say, when we can wrestle with like something as simple as, or not as simple, but um, like, hey, what kinds of, of sexual behavior are you having and how might that put me at risk? And what is what is our understood mutual level of acceptable risk? Yeah. And, and I also think the level of acceptable risk conversation is really robust right now because there's no, Nobody has zero risk, yeah. right, for COVID-19 right now. And similarly, when we talk about safe sex, we get this idea that there's some like perfectly safe state that we can achieve instead of talking about safer sex and what is the level of risk that we're willing to take. Yeah. Um, every sexual decision brings risk with it, including the decision not to have sex, yeah. brings a whole host of social emotional risks with it. Um, so when we see that there's no zero risk choice to be had, uh, so let's figure out where our comfort levels are and, and where we can come together. That's wonderful practice. That's like perfectly parallels the way we talk about the risks that involve in being in sexual intimacy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Molly, I think we have uh, one more. Um. Yeah, so um, actually this is, we were just talking about for people who are home with families. Um, do you have any tips for talking to kids about consent and boundaries? Um, you know, especially around alone time, you know, when you need that alone time, how do you explain that to younger kids? Well, I think one way you explain it to younger kids is you give them some of it too, right? As much as possible, you show them that they get to have consent or, or not consent or and, and have their own boundaries. Now, obviously, you have to be the parent, they, you, they have to be the child, which means sometimes that you will do something with your kids that you would never do with another adult. Like, you know, they'll pick them up and take them out of a store or like, uh, <laughs> you'll say, I don't care, I'm going to wash your butt now, right? Like, even though you don't want me to touch your butt, like, um, it's not an exact parallel, but you find as many opportunities as possible to let them know that they get to say yes or no to things and that they get to have their own boundaries. And when you teach them that, then it's a lot easier to say mama or dad or whatever you, however you refer to yourself, like I get to have my own boundaries now too. Remember we talked about how you get this, this is my time to get this, or this is the way I'm getting that. Um, so I think that teaching it is a universal practice that they benefit from um, a really wonderful way in. And that starts for a lot of people with letting them say no to hugging and kissing um, or tickling or those sorts of play uh, and affection. Right. And that can hurt our feelings. Right. Like you yeah. love these little kids and you just want to hug and kiss them. But if you teach them that they get to say yes or no to being hugged or kissed and you you make a practice of asking them, you stand up to your parents or your cousins, or your aunt and uncle when they want to insist, like you say, no, you know, my child gets to say yes or no to that and they don't feel like it right now. Maybe you teach them an alternative. Like if you don't feel like being hugged or kissed, can you offer a handshake or can you blow a kiss or, you know, do you, you can teach them about being nice and considerate while you're teaching them about their having their own boundaries. But if, if you teach them, also teach them that in their, in their play and their roughhousing, right? Like it's only fun if everybody's having fun, right? Is a, is a rule that you can teach kids that they really understand. Um, so, you know, if you teach them how to practice it with each other and that they get the right to it, um, you'll have a lot easier time, I think, being like, this is the time when mommy gets to set a boundary. 
Yeah, I think kids are, 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 they learn things, I think, a lot more quickly than we, we give them credit for sometimes. I have a four-year-old who's in that phase of no kisses. Mm -hmm. And while it breaks my heart as a mom sometimes, like as a feminist, I'm like, every time she's like, no kisses, and she like sternly says it and reminds me and my husband, yeah. I'm like, yes, yes. So, <laughs> they are very absorbent. Can I get no kissing well. edict right now? <laughs> she, it's a no kissing, but hugs are All okay. Right. So we're taking it. I'm mean, thinking of the videos that have gone around about um, the kids coming into their classroom get to. Oh, I love yeah. those. Me yeah, too. I kind of, it, yes. you know, I'm I'm actually like not to not to pitch the app, but I'm pitching the app. Um, you know, it's kind of like the hashtags tell you, like, you know, if I have like um, coffee dates and long conversations, then then like, if you say to me, like, hey, I'd love to chat and see if we want to go out on a coffee date. Like, I'm, I'm feeling really hurt because I'm like, oh, you, you read, you read what I'm looking for. And, and like, yeah. I'm more willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I'm more willing to engage with you with a little bit more of a sense of safety, because you've acknowledged the boundary that I put down, or you acknowledge the desire that I put down. Yeah. And for the folks who don't know the videos we're talking about, there are some wonderful kindergarten or young, younger classrooms where the teacher will put up um, like a range of like six different options of how to greet the teacher on the way in. So like, do you want a hug? Do you want a fist bump? Do you want a high five? Do you want a wave? And so the kid will just point at whatever symbol on the sort of board right outside the classroom and the teacher will greet them in their in their preferred way and that's a delightful and very positive way to practice consent right it's not just about like don't do something unless you get somebody's consent right that which can feel more punitive as a place to start from mm -hmm. but instead like teaching them like yeah what you tell me how do you want me to interact with you right now here here's a range of options let's do one um and, and that can really create a, a very positive association with the idea of consent. I think the same thing works for adults. Um, you know, like when, when we, you know, I, um, as somebody who's been active in the BDSM and kink communities for a long time, um, the way that we, you know, that I was initially told that you negotiated with a scene was to say all your hard limits. And it's like, okay, so I'm not into this. I'm not into this. I'm not into like, whatever. I'm not into this. And it's like, that's kind of a deflating thing um and what what we've now moved to is more you know i use more of a yes means yes and it's like what are three things that you want to experience what are three things that would you know how do i know what look at what having fun looks like for you and so asking people to give me their yeses and then checking with them about like okay how will i know from you whether this isn't fun anymore what are the things that you definitely don't want me to do um, and I think it makes it a lot more fun to to like have the consent conversation when you're starting it out from a place of this is what I know that I like. Um, yeah. And that's why yes means yes is such a powerful framework. Yeah. And and just to be clear, and I know you know this, but yes means yes does not obliterate no means no, just in the same way that starting the conversation with what you want to say yes to, what you want to experience, doesn't mean you shouldn't also talk about what your hard limits are, right? But when you're only getting to say no to things mm -hmm. it's not sexy <laughs> um it's you know and it's 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 an unpleasant it feels punitive it can feel rejecting you know it just brings up a lot of feelings whereas when we talk about pleasure and what we're excited about together as well as the things that are no goes um that makes a well-rounded yeah. interaction a well-rounded relationship and i think it's it makes it even more personally empowering you know, yeah. you know, ask, being asked about what makes it good for us is is inherently more uplifting. Um, and, you know, it's it's important that our boundaries are respected. It's also important that our joys are respected. Um, so, you know, like I'm wondering if like having having a conversation and I have no kids. So this is just me spitballing. But I'm wondering if having a conversation with kids, it's like, you know, um, we're going to have alone time now. What, what would you like to do in your alone time that would make you feel really good? You know, yeah. Um, kind of like, you know, like, yeah. do you want, do you want some books? Do you want to, 
you know, do you want a bubble bath? Do you like, what would feel good for you in this alone time could be a great way of framing it as well. You know, that reminds me of something that I've been uh-huh. doing for a while, but have been relying on a lot more in COVID times, which is I've made a list of things that tend to make me feel good. Like when I feel just really stuck and sad and like paralyzed and I have a little list of like, go on a walk, bake something, right? Like it's it's not a fancy list, right? It's not, you could probably make yeah. it up and you'd be close to what's on my list, right? Like it's, um, <laughs> but it's, it's a, remi- it's like a note to self about like, when I'm like in a, in a stuck or spinny place to be like, you could take your feeling the way you are right now and just go 10, spend 10 minutes doing one of these things mm-hmm. and you might feel a little better. Um, and so I wonder if it might be nice to work with kids to make a list for themselves too. Like when they're in a good space at some point, yeah. not when they're melting down, but when they're in a good space, like make a little list that they generate of things that they tend to like to do that tend to make them happy. Um, and then when they feel a little stuck about like, well, I don't want you to go have alone time. I don't want to have alone time right now. Um, you can, that's, you know, redirect and be like, well, can we pick something from your list of things that make you happy? Yeah. I love that. I think that's a great idea. I'm going to try that this week. And I guarantee you that will be submitted as a homeschool. Like that counts for something, right? Oh. <laughs> we made this list. Honey, that counts for something. it all counts because <laughs> the idea that you're supposed to like keep up on, there's just so much capitalistic sickness happening around like no, not losing productivity right now. It's there's a meme that's been going around that says like, you're not working from home. You're like at home during a global pandemic, trying to get some work done. I think that goes for school too. Like the idea that we should be like not missing a beat with our productivity right now is it's truly a capitalist sickness. I've been encouraging folks to like, remember that we're all, you know, and I do use a trauma framework and I, you know, I tell people like we are all in trauma and the compassionate part of ourselves would not expect somebody who is in trauma to be on top of everything, all the conversations, hundred percent perfect. And so we can use this as an opportunity to go like, Oh, okay. You know, like I'm actually surviving through this thing. Why don't I go ahead and give myself the compassion? Um, and give yeah. my partner the compassion, like assume, you know, where, where at all possible, assume positive intent and make room for the fact that nobody's working at their best and, and kind of go from that perspective. Um, I think it can make things a little bit, uh, I don't know. I, I want folks to be gentle with themselves. And I think like framing it like that helps us to kind of go like, Oh yeah, this is a real thing, particularly for those of us who've had gaslighting kind of experiences in our life. It's like, Oh, Okay my cognitive f- function is down. That's pretty normal right now. Okay. Maybe I don't have to beat myself up about that, you know? So for sure. Um, Miley, any other questions? I think that was it for questions. And I think that's a great note for us to kind of wrap up on, you know, a yeah. reminder to be gentle with yourselves and the Thank people you. around you right now that, you know, we're all experiencing a lot of stress that has us, you know, yeah. Um, you know, just needing to all sometimes take some space. And, and I think that some of these tips that Jacqueline has given us tonight to, um, to establish some of that space and boundaries are going to be really helpful for, I hope for a lot of you. I know I'm, I'm looking forward to implementing some of them with, with my family. Um, and also, you know, we hope that you join us. If you're looking for people to connect with, if you're lonely at home, hashtag open is a really welcoming, inclusive community to come find those connections. And as you go through, you know, using those hashtags to communicate what you're looking for is in your preferences, interests, and boundaries. I think that's kind of a good way to start. Maybe, you know, start if you're not, if you're not comfortable really communicating what you're looking for, it's a good way to start kind of practicing or even just thinking about what you're, what those those look like for you those preferences interests and boundaries might look like for you so it's a good um it's a good little way to start um we have a great tool for that we can upload the link i think hannah can probably put that into our chat for us um we have a worksheet that could help you with that so that might be a good start for you if you're kind of wondering where do i where do i get started for even um i know we had that one user who wasn't even sure what what she was looking for yeah so thank you so much jacqueline what a great 
and perfectly timed um, topic for us to have as a part of our open end series. Really, thank you so much for joining us. Right. Total pleasure. And I hope that everybody just stays as safe yeah. and, and sane as they can and finds pleasure where you can also. So um, the, yeah. the other, uh, this is a, I'm really glad that we did this conversation this week. Next week, we're actually going to totally flip it. And we're talking about cyber sex and dirty talk. And, and so it's kind <laughs> of like, I think thinking about consent as we move into that, it like becomes even more powerful when we're engaging in that, like that intimate frisky play with somebody. Um, like, so like take what we've talked about today, tuck it into the back of your head. And then next week we have Jamie LeClaire who's going to be doing um, their amazing cyber sex and dirty talk workshop, which like definitely gonna shake things up a little bit. So. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, Jacqueline, thank you so much. It is absolutely a joy to share some space with you and I hope that you and yours stay healthy. Um, and thank you to everybody who was here tonight and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>